to see it, Lord. You want to fuck me, tell you. You want to tell you. See my sisters and daughters here, the congregation, Lord, we donate their needs. We'll be sure. We'll come amongst your people. Yeah. Come amongst them, Lord. Meet their need. Meet all our needs, Lord. Operations, people, care of the illness and sickness and bereavements, Lord. Worry about our souls, will the rehab will happen. Lord, we are grateful. Mm -hmm. Give us your soul. And then he gives us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, come. Come on, tell me. Clear our hearts. Come as we break bread amongst us, Lord. Jesus, the same night as he was betrayed to the bread, you know, taking the bread, touching that upper room, freshly baked bread, he could smell it on, he took it, he broke it, and he gave it. Oh, he gave me the thanks, he break it, and said, take it, this is my body, but it's just broken for you. This dear remembers of me. Of the same manner, he also took the cup of many subs, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This you do as often you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's day until we come. Wherefore, if we shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord on more than, so be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a man and a woman examine themselves, let them eat the bread and drink the cup. We're not here to examine it. But we are soccer to go. I'm not here to judge anybody. You're not here to judge me here. But you summon your son as well. He that eateth and drinketh, or whether he eateth and drinketh, at least himself, not discerning the Lord's body. This caused many to wait and sick about the amount of sleep. We judge ourselves, but we not be judged. What I hear that our brothers and sisters say, we're here to remember him. What he did for us in Calvary. Upon him, the son of the world, his broken body, and of death, he dies, he rose from the grave again. Hallelujah. It was taken last night, another night, and I thought about it on the road to Amos, the three people rushing along the way. That seven men must have took them hours and hours and hours and hours to walk, and all the gardens. But when I came a stranger alongside them, they started talking about what happened in Jerusalem. And later on, the Lord took over and started telling him, then I know what's going to happen. Because if he thought I got them in the name, when he sat down with them, they didn't know him. When they sat down with them, they broke the bread. What does that show me? That showed me his mannerisms. He was used to baking the bread. And I said, Lord, when I went in the place, is my mannerism show me that I'm a Christian? Does your mannerism show that you're a child of God? Or did I see something else? Another way they recognized him. And he took the bread and he broke that bread. They must have seen his hands. His hands and wounds on them for us. They recognized him. That was the Savior. And that's what he does when he draws to close to people's own Savior. He says, to them. He shows me that that's for you. We all say amen. 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 Let's pray bread together. It's just a meal. You do your own. Two bread. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Keep the cup.
Welcome again, everyone. Just good to see you all this morning. So good that you're here, and it's wonderful that we're together in the name of the Lord, in the house of the Lord, on the Lord's day as well. And we trust that you're well. And if you're here for the first time, we do give you that special welcome. But we're looking to the Savior again this morning. We're going to look into his word now. We've had our time of worship. We have come to the Lord's table that reminds us of his love. And if you've got your Bible, we're going to turn to the Gospel of John chapter 1. Please turn to John chapter 1 and verse 15. Just a couple of verses here. John 1 and verse number 15. And I just want to speak to you for a little while on the subject of really experiencing, receiving the fullness of the blessing of God. Let me say that to you again because I, I wanted to register with us all. Experiencing, receiving the fullness of the blessing of God. If you were here last Sunday morning, Pastor George spoke on God's blessing. An extract from the life of Abraham and we understood what that meant to Abraham. But you know, all of this week has just registered with me day after day that in the blessing of God is everything that we need. Come on, say a good amen, Christian. If you, you know that, say a good, come on, say it again. Amen. In the blessing of God is everything. Now, everything that you need in this life and beyond. Everything, and that's why we have to cherish it, we have to value it, we have to understand it. And I just want to talk about the fullness of God's blessing, how it extends to us, how it touches every area. I want to try and prove that to you, that in the blessing of God is everything that we need. Listen to these verses, John 1 and verse number 15. John bore witness of him, the Lord Jesus, and cried out. You know, when he fills your life, you cry out, either in praise and witness and testimony. John cried out saying, this is he of whom I said, he who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And look what it says next. And of his fullness, we have all received and grace on grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Can we pray for a minute? Can we just bow our heads as we look to the Lord again? We're taking nothing for granted. Pastor Tommy has said it. We need the Lord's presence to come near this morning. And Lord, we need it now for your word. And we pray for that heavenly illumination that takes us beyond the natural, that opens our eyes and our understanding and our very heart and our very soul. And would you do that again with your word right now? Or our heart and thoughts are with our pastor this morning. Bless him and refresh him and heal him and let him know we're thinking about him. Lord, bless your word to our hearts and glorify your great and your mighty name. Amen and amen. Verse 16 of what we have read says these words, And of his fullness... We have all received and grace for grace. 
Now that's a very important verse in the Bible. It's pivotal in so many ways. Another translation puts it this way, from the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. Now that's the Christian's experience. That's what happens in the Christian life. And on the grounds of that, I just want to talk for a few minutes about the fullness of the Lord's blessing. Because honestly, folks, God's blessing is everything. And I know when we talk about something so often, it can lose its potency or we can get familiar with it. But another reminder after last week that God's blessing really is everything. And we need to be educated about it. We, we need to understand about it. And then when we do that, we value it. And then when you value it, you cherish it. And then when you do that, you'll do everything to keep it. The fullness of God's blessing. You know, there's a verse in the book of Colossians chapter 1 and verse 19, and it talks about the Lord Jesus, and it says these words, For it pleased the Father that in Him all the fullness should dwell. And then there's another verse in the, in the next chapter in Colossians, it says, For in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you know, it's amazing to really think about Jesus' fullness, Jesus' abundance, His fullness this morning, and it's the thought of receiving that into yourself and having that as part of your life and living and walking and experiencing the reality of that that I just want to try and bring home again this morning. From his fullness it says, we have all received one blessing after another. That's just a wonderful Bible verse. But you know, when a person becomes a Christian, when they come to the Lord for themselves, and it's personal. This is what makes God's salvation so wonderful and so powerful. It's a personal experience. You can come to church and join in and be with everyone else, but you've got to know God personally. You've got to receive from Him personally. But when a person does that, the truth is, the Lord often takes things away from you. The truth is, sometimes He has to take things out of your life. Sometimes even people. And in a sense, in a real, real sense, He empties you. And there's a moment, there's a time when you feel that emptiness. I remember when I came to the Lord and I was from the back streets of Belfast. We didn't do church. We, didn't, we weren't churchy people. And I say that respectfully to, to, I don't say to any churchy people here. But we, we weren't churchy. We were from the back streets. We, we grew up in, in a, a different culture, a different mindset. But yet I knew in my life something was missing. I knew I needed something out of this world. And I was on a quest to find out, is God real? And if he's real, how can I get to know him? And I really want to be careful what I say here. Because I'll, I'll put it generally. I went to certain churches, not mentioning any names and denominations, and not mentioning, and I just didn't fit in. And I've said it before, I remember one night going to a church and opening a suite in the church, sitting on the pew, and I opened the suite, and honestly, you would have thought in that moment I had committed the unpardonable sin, because they must have heard the rapper, and everyone just looked around, and I was stunned, I was shot. I thought they were going to shoot me against the wall. And I couldn't wait to get out, and I thought, I'm never going to, and, I, and I, I, got a, I got a blog each, you see, and I thought, God, this is for me. But then God saved my dad. 
and changed his life. And I knew God, only God could do that, but he did. And our whole home was changed. And I experienced that for myself when I came to the Lord. But I remember, and I was thinking about it over the weekend, I remember sitting in Woodfield Park on my own on the bench. And I'd come to Jesus. And I wasn't messing about, I wasn't interested in John and church culture. It wasn't, that's not what it was about. It had to be real. And I was sitting on that church bench, and the ironic thing was this. Didn't have a job. Didn't have a relationship at that time. Didn't have a suit to wear even to go to church. And I was just in that moment thinking about everything that wasn't in my life, that God had taken out of my life, and I felt that emptiness. But here's the strange thing. Sitting on that park bench, I was the happiest guy in Belfast. Because I knew God had come into my life. In a real way. Hallelujah. In a different way. In a powerful way. And it's hard to put into words, but you've got to experience it. God sometimes takes things away. He has to empty, and often he does. But God does that for a reason. And when he does that, he doesn't leave you empty. He puts other things in their place. When he takes things away, he puts something better in their place. When he takes someone away, he puts someone better in their place. It's his making of you. And it happens over the process of time. And so it says here, from his fullness, we have all received. And John wrote that. And he was looking at people who had received that. And they knew they had received it. And he put it this way, one blessing after another. Hey, listen, it's still the same today. Come on, will you say good amen? It's still the same this morning. He's got blessing this week. We're vessels, by the way. God's made us in that way. We're vessels. And, and, and there's an appreciation of this. A vessel always has to be full. To be purposeful, you've got to be full. If there's a vacuum, it will be filled. But what's crucial? Is that you fill up with the right things. For most of our lives without the Lord, we were filled with the wrong things. The Bible says we're vessels. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 7. We have this treasure in earthen vessels or jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and is not of us. According to the Bible, we're jars of clay. If you know anything about clay, it's not perfect. I'm so glad, by the way, it says we're jars of clay. It say that we're jars of marble. That marble has a perfection about it. Or granite, you couldn't break granite. But clay is different. We're cracked, we're broken, we're stained, we're vulnerable. That is us, but we're still jars, and as such, we will be filled with things, but we've got to get filled with the right things. And this morning, that's where the blessing of God comes in. And I just want to spend a moment to bring this home to us by saying this, we have been filled with his blessing, one blessing after another. And here's where it starts, being filled with the blessing of the fullness of God's pardon. Let me say that again. There is a full pardon for anyone who comes to Jesus. No matter who they are, no matter what they have done, no matter what they are involved in, the cross says that debt is paid in full. Do you know when Jesus hung on the cross in those last minutes? And we've remembered him this morning. We have poured out our heart. Pastor Tommy has led us in that. And, and we have thanked the Lord for the cross. We sang it at the beginning. But do you know when those last moments, when he was in that excruciating pain, and by the way, the word excruciation comes from this crucifixion. The pain Jesus suffered was so severe, they didn't even have a word to describe it. And so they came up with this word, excruciating, and it means the pain that comes out of the cross. But in those moments, he said something. In fact, he cried something. Tetelestai. 
it, it is in the Greek. Just one word, telesta. And he cried that on the cross. But here's what it means. Ted in full. Head in full. The cross says this morning that, that our debt is paid in full. There's the fullness of God's pardon this morning. There's the fullness of God's salvation. In fact, there's no other form of salvation but full salvation. You can't be half saved. You can't be half pardoned. God says through his love, I will forgive all your sins. God says, I will cover all your transgressions. I will pardon all your iniquities. The Bible says in the book of 1 John, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses from all our sin. Anybody out there glad of that? I am. Well, the enemy can come to you, Christian. He comes to me and he reminds you of things of the past. He reminds you of what you've done, what you were involved in, the things you've committed. And, and there's a cloud that can come with that. And there's guilt and shame and embarrassment that comes with that. But listen, we're fully forgiven. We're fully pardoned. All our sin, all our transgressions, all our iniquities. And that's what we have received in its fullness this morning. That's the greatest blessing of all, by the way. That's the greatest thing of all. But it leads to more things from his fullness we have all received. There's also the fullness of God's peace today. And folks, this is one of the greatest commodities in all the world. God's peace. There's nothing like it. The peace of God. The Bible itself says it surpasses all understanding. It transcends logic. It transcends circumstance. It, it, it goes beyond your problems. It goes beyond conflict of heart or whatever. You need the peace of God. It's the greatest commodity. And I'm using that word for a reason. Commodity. You see, with the peace of God, you exchange something for it. That's why it's a commodity. You don't do that with salvation, because Jesus already paid it. But with God's peace in day-to-day -day life, it's a commodity. You exchange something for it. Even you exchange your anxiety for his peace. Your fear for heavenly peace. Your worry. And all that comes with that, that goes when the peace of God comes in. By the way, the Lord wants to give us that today. Not only that, folks, according to what we're looking at and centering on, it's right, it's legitimate to even say this, He wants to fill you with it. I love this man's testimony who led us, Pastor Donald. He told me at one time, and we banter about it and whatever, but if you don't know it, during the time of our troubles, he was with the security forces trying to bring peace to Northern Ireland. And yet his life was in turmoil. And his testimony is this, in the road, he was in an army center, keeping watch, desperately seeking to bring peace, and, and, and his heart was in it. He wanted to bring peace to Northern Ireland. And in that moment, in that sanger, God spoke into Tommy's life and reminded him, you're trying to bring peace to a country and you haven't even got peace in your life. How does that work? I tell you, that's what God does. There's enlightenment with that. There's revelation with that. Then that becomes an acknowledgement. And that acknowledgement goes deep because that acknowledgement says, I can't really do it. That acknowledgement says, who am I kid? And then it becomes surrender. And that's when God can do something with you. When you surrender. But he wants to fill you with his peace. Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. I met a man the other day called Thomas Watson. He's a Bible commentator. And, and he, he said this, it just it touched me. He says, if God be our God, he will give us peace in our trouble. 
when there is a storm without, he will make peace with them. The world can create trouble and peace, but God can create peace in the time of your trouble. That's true this morning. It's wonderful to receive the fullness of his peace. And remember what we're looking at. From his fullness we've all received one blessing after another. And these are not just positive words or positive thinking. We have experienced this. That's why we've come to worship today. Amen. But what about this as we come to the conclusion? The fullness not only of his peace. The fullness of his presence. His presence. You see, see, for me, if I'm opening my heart to you, this is what makes Christianity wonderful. I get to be with him every day. I have, and, and in our, that park bench, and in my own experience, and yours is different, you've got yours, but yours is as real as mine, and mine is as real as yours. It's a Christian. But I've never lost the wonder of that in all the years. He walks with me. He talks with me. He's with me. He even went as far as to say, I'm never going to leave you. And I'm never going to forsake you. It even reads the same backwards. If you didn't know, you forsake nor you leave, never will I. I was taking a school assembly one day and it was chaos. I'm terrible with kids. I'm trying to talk to kids. And it just, I was really in the comfort zone, trying to get a handful of them, and they were running rad, they weren't listening to a word, and weren't, the teachers were looking at me and shirting their shoulders and looking at their watch. And then I, I got an idea and I said, anybody got any tricks? I've got a trick. And the Lord, they said, what's your trick? I says, I can speak backwards. I can see them in the church and saying, how does that work? And what's that going to sound like? I said, no, I can speak backwards. And somebody said, well, go on, speak backwards. And let me speak forward first. I quoted that. Uh, Jesus said, I'll never leave you or I'll never forsake you. And I said, here's what it means backwards. You forsake nor you leave, never will I. And we're laughing and listen as we close. That's how, long, that's how much he meant it. That's how much he meant it. Even in his word he promised, I'm with you always, even to the end of the road. It means something to have him with you every day. You know what it means? All things are possible. You're never alone. You're provided for. You're protected. You're guided. I was thinking a while ago, just in this chaotic time we're in, and, and all the uncertainty, and how everything is shaking, and how people are just feeling them more than ever, how everything is unstable. But you know what? If ever we needed a shepherd, it's now. Yeah. And I know that's really simple because that's such an iconic image in Christianity of the shepherd. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. We know that going right back to David. But if ever we needed a shepherd, it's now. Yeah. A shepherd not only leads, he feeds. The shepherd not only provides, he protects. Jesus does everything. But here's the point of this little message today. He does it to the full. And to see if you trace the image, the imagery in the Bible of the shepherd back to King David and his famous psalm, you'll come to a line in it when he talks about the Lord and it's very obvious. But he says this, the Lord is my shepherd. Now David was a shepherd. He provided for the sheep. He guided them. He protected them. He gave them all. He took them to the right places. He saw them through. He made sure they were all right. And there must have been a moment when David just looked at all that imagery and all that truth. And he stood back and just grasped it. But I have a heavenly shepherd. And I shall not want. And then if you come to the middle of the psalm, you'll find out that the whole stance changes. It moves from God being the great shepherd. At the end of Psalm 23, God, there's a shift in the language. And God becomes not so much the great shepherd, but the great host. 
David says, you prepare a table before me. And he ends by saying, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But right in the middle, and I want to end by just bringing this to you. David said this out of experience. Here's what he said. My cup overflows. My cup flows over. And that's just another truth of what we're talking about this morning. The fullness of God's blessing. We bow our heads for a second.
Father, but come here again, that name. Oh, what a name. They can shout all the while that football matches, but what a name that we have, Jesus. We ask you this morning, Lord, to come on amongst your people. Stay with us that they don't go dead. Swim so home to our homes, Lord, rivers meet us, Lord. Give us the strength to face them. But take us home to your safety, Lord. Thank you for the words this morning. That fruitless Lord. Oh, Father God, help us that they to live that life, Lord. That they are your short. We're asking you to come, Lord Jesus. Oh, Holy Spirit, would you come amongst your people and take us home to be with loved ones who's maybe not saved. And may they see something in us, Lord. And may our hearts burn with desire. But Father, bless us. Remember, yeah. Pastor. Remember that. Remember the rest of the sick people sitting here, Lord, and they're not well. They're here, Lord. Meet them at their point of need. But Father, take us to your home, save them. I ask it all in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Amen.